Samsung was extra ambitious this year, launching the souped-up S20 Ultra alongside a more conventional pair of flagships. In our review, though, the Ultra turned out to be an impressive but impractical device. Most people should clearly consider something more sensible, like the regular S20s. The S20 and S20 Plus have the same smooth displays and 5G support as their larger sibling, as well as cameras that aren't as excessive. That's fine, because they were not as expensive either. At $1,000 and $1,200 respectively, the S20 and S20 Plus are at least in the same ballpark as other flagships. After a week testing the S20 Ultra, switching to the S20 and S20 Plus felt like blessed relief to my arms and fingers. The smaller handsets are much more manageable, both in terms of weight and screen size. My personal preference is the 6.2-inch S20, which is much easier to type on with one hand. But those with bigger hands probably won't mind the 6.7-inch S20+. Plus. This year's flagships are slightly curvier and have softer lines than the boxy S10s, which makes them easier to hold. They're not the most inspired designs, but these are still the classiest Android flagships you'll find right now. The OnePlus 70 Pro has an attractive finish but lacks the subtle curves, and the Pixel 4's minimalist design is unique but it doesn't feel as premium. Huawei's P-series might be the only phones, barring iPhones, that offer a similarly elegant build, but you can't buy them in the US. The S20s also best most existing Android flagships with their 120Hz screens. So far, only the Asus ROG Phone 2 and Razer Phone 2 offer screens this fast, and both of those are niche devices with a focus on gaming. Some mainstream options, like the Pixel 4 and OnePlus 70 Pro, hit 90Hz, but nearly every other device sticks with 60Hz. Why does that matter? Faster refresh rates mean smoother animations and more fluid video. But there's a caveat. Like the Ultra, the S20 and S20 Plus only support 120Hz at a 1080p resolution, not the native 1440p. This is less of an issue on the smaller S20s, where the difference in resolution isn't as noticeable. Because they're not as big, these panels are more pixel-dense and look better than the Ultra's 6.9-inch display. The effects of the 120Hz rate also seemed more obvious on the S20. Still, I didn't find myself missing the faster speeds compared to the Pixel 4 or even the Pixel 3. Refresh rates aside, the S20 screens are gorgeous. Samsung continues to excel at building displays, and its latest flagships have the deep blacks and rich colors that I've come to expect from a Galaxy device. I could make out Nick Offerman's straggly strands of hair even in a pitch black forest in a scene from Devs, and the screen's bright enough to read in sunlight. One of the compromises you'll be making by choosing an S20 or S20 Plus instead of an Ultra is getting a less advanced camera system. The Ultra's marquee feature is a 100x space zoom that combines a 4x optical zoom with some digital wizardry to try and improve clarity. The S20 and S20 Plus, meanwhile, just go up to 30 times with a 3x optical zoom system. You also won't find the 108 megapixel sensor that's on the largest flagship. Instead, the primary camera here shoots at a maximum of 64 megapixels. But frankly, you're not missing out on much. The S20 Ultra's picture quality was pretty bad when zoomed in beyond 10x, and the full resolution 108 megapixel pictures were surprisingly noisy. Plus, Samsung had to issue a software update after several reviewers complained about issues with the autofocus. While I didn't notice the autofocus problem on my S20 Ultra, I did see the S20 and S20 Plus struggle as I was framing up shots. It's strange. The camera would spend a few seconds shifting in and out before finally focusing or just giving up entirely. I haven't received the software update that's supposed to fix this yet, and Samsung said it's still in the works. Space Zoom remains an impressive sounding, but not particularly useful feature. I got great photos at 1x and using the ultra wide angle camera. But when I zoomed in on a bus map across the street, the resulting images were a disaster. All I could make out from the muddy photo was the general shape of the bus's route. I couldn't see a single word. I did like Samsung's night mode on the new flagships though. 
The algorithm uses more information than before, capturing more frames at varying exposures to stitch together brighter pictures in low light. The difference is night and day. Even though photos I took of nightscapes weren't very dark without night mode enabled, I still got better, cleaner results when I did activate it. Night mode on the S20 and S20 Plus is pretty much the same as it is on the Ultra, as are new features like 8K video capture and single take mode. The latter snaps a variety of photos and clips through the different lenses as you shoot your subject for a few seconds, and then it applies filters, effects, or soundtracks to them. It's fun! but not helpful enough that I'd use it more than a few times. The front-facing camera is also different from the Ultra. Rather than a 40 megapixel sensor, you get a 10 MP one in the S20 and S20 Plus. In general, I didn't notice a huge difference in quality, especially since the S20 Ultra shoots selfies at 12 megapixels by default. When 40 MP mode was enabled, the super sharp images definitely had more detail than the S20 and S20 Plus delivered, but I didn't miss the extra clarity, except in low light. The cameras are perhaps the biggest difference between the S20 Ultra and the S20 and S20 Plus. All three phones pack the same Snapdragon 865 processor with 12 gigs of RAM. There is an upgraded Ultra with 16 gigs, but that's kinda overkill, especially when laptops usually come with between 8 and 16 gigs of RAM. As I jump between editing a picture and playing a game while chatting with some friends, the S20 and S20 Plus didn't so much as hiccup. The S20 also kept up as I shot 8K video while downloading a 1.4 gig app over LTE, though it did get quite warm in the process. I even found the in-screen fingerprint sensors surprisingly fast. Samsung uses ultrasound scanners as opposed to the optical reader in the OnePlus 7T Pro, and I haven't noticed a significant difference in speed. It's worth noting though that some reviewers have been frustrated by the S20's reader. My main issue has been in trying to locate where to place my finger to unlock the phone when its screen is off. I wish Samsung had gone for Qualcomm's new, larger fingerprint sensor instead, so it would be easier to find. One of the things Samsung is calling attention to on the S20 lineup is 5G support across all three devices. It's a signal that the next-gen networking standard is getting ready to go mainstream. That's a nice story to tell the public, but it's incomplete. Yes, 5G is here, but coverage isn't very comprehensive yet. I use the S20 Plus and Ultra on Verizon's 5G network. It's really fast, but coverage is very limited. I tested the S20 on T-Mobile's network, and the story is largely the same. T-Mobile offers both sub-6 and millimeter wave 5G in New York, but spots with a much faster millimeter wave are few and far between. Not to mention that the S20 doesn't support them, only the Plus and Ultra model do. But 600 megahertz connectivity appears more widely available. There was an issue with my S20 SIM card and I never got to connect to 5G at all. So there's not much I can say now about T-Mobile's network speeds. T-Mobile did say that in some places, 600 megahertz 5G will be a lot faster than LTE. In others, customers won't see a dramatic difference. On average though, the carrier said there should be a 20% download speed boost over its LTE network. What was noticeable on the S20 and S20 Plus was their long-lasting batteries. Thanks to their large 4000 mAh and 4500 mAh cells, the two phones lasted surprisingly long despite power-draining features like high refresh rate screens and 5G. I set the displays to 120 Hz and consistently got close to two full days out of both flagships. On our battery test, which involves looping a Full HD video, the S20 clocked a little more than 12 hours, while the Plus hit 15 hours. That's longer than the Ultra's 11 and a half hour mark and the Plus ties with the Pixel 4 XL. The S20 and S20 Plus are basically the same phone, aside from their differences in size, battery, and millimeter wave support. The Plus also has an additional depth sensor on its back for slightly better portrait mode and AR effects. Are those features worth the extra $200 for the larger phone? Only if you really want a bigger screen, extra long battery, and super fast 5G on T-Mobile. Verizon offers a millimeter wave compatible S20, so your decision will also depend on what carrier you're on. 
For most people though, the base S20 is plenty of foam. In the case of this year's S20 Trio, smaller is so much better. I felt like the Ultra was overkill when it came to size, camera features, and most importantly, price. At $1,000, the S20 costs about the same as its competitors, though the S20 Plus still comes in at a premium. But they're also the best looking Android flagships around with speedy performance and long battery life. For that money, you'll also be getting excellent displays and blazing 5G speeds where available. If $1,000 is too much for you, you might want to wait for other options like the rumored Pixel 4a or consider the S10 series, which could offer most of what you need for a fraction of the price. Right now though, the S20 and S20 Plus are the best Android phones money can buy. For more reviews of Android phones, iPhones, wearables, and laptops, make sure to subscribe to Engadget.